Well, good morning, church. It's so good to see you. It's so good to gather with our church family online as well. Like Ryan mentioned, we're continuing our study in the book of Nehemiah. Today we're in chapter three. So if you wanna grab your Bible or your Bible app or just your internet browser, biblegateway.com will get you there and find the book of Nehemiah. And we're gonna be studying in chapter three. And while you're turning it up, I just wanna give you an invitation this Wednesday night to come and join us as a church as we gather. It's our monthly uh, church-wide prayer gathering, but this month, it's, or this month, yeah, it's actually been hosted by our worship community. It's gonna be an encounter night. So it's gonna be an evening of worship and prayer and prophetic witness, and that's this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. It's gonna be awesome, and we would love to see lots of you here on Wednesday. Okay, let's dive into the word for today. So we're in the story of Nehemiah, and over the last three weeks, Ryan and myself have been kind of chugging along through the story, And now we're at the point in this story where we move from ideas to action. So the plans for rebuilding the walls have been laid and the resources have been collected. So they've got the wood, they've got the timber, they've been the bunnings. The vision for the work has been cast, but now it's time to get to work. Okay, it's game time. I don't know if any of you have ever been involved in say a project where you've been on the planning team and you've been sitting for hours and hours in committee meetings, planning, taking notes, getting all the stuff together. And then all of a sudden, the event arrives and you've gotta move from theory into action. Or maybe you're an athlete here today, you've played footy or rugby or maybe, I don't know, darts. Maybe you do this when you play darts, but you do all your practice, all your practice, but then it's time to actually step onto the field, step into the arena, it's game time. I remember, whenever I was interviewing for my job here at Riverview, it was a really exciting time because we were locked down in Canada, couldn't go anywhere, and so it was so awesome. I was making new friends halfway around the world via Zoom, and I was getting to meet new people. I had the opportunity as I went through the process with the board, with the staff, to share my story, my qualifications, my experience, my philosophy of ministry, my heart, my calling. My wife, Rebecca, would be sitting off to the side secretly. No one knew that she would be on the call. And every time I would get off another interview, she would just say, Steve, I'm convinced that the reason you do job interviews is just to make new friends. <laughs> and, and maybe there's a little bit of that, but I was making new friends. And God, it was very evident to me that God was very much involved in the process. I could just feel that. But then there was one night, in fact, it's the middle of the night because there's a 12 hour time difference between here and where we were living in Canada when my phone pinged and it was a note from the HR lady who was leading the process alongside the board and it just simply said, hey Steve, are you awake? We need to chat. And I'm like, well, I'm awake now, thanks very much. So I did what I've been doing for the previous two years of leading a church online, leading meetings online, leading staff online. I got out of bed, I put on a dress shirt, and I just kept my pajama bottoms on. So my Star Wars PJs and then a nice fancy shirt. And I went down and I Zoom called to Australia where I was told over a Zoom call, hey Steve, the board would love you to come and be the senior minister at Riverview. Now in that moment, I gotta tell you, it wasn't joy that I felt. It wasn't elation, it was terror. <laughs> and it was fear, and in my stomach, I just felt like I wanted to like barf. I was so, because up until this moment, it had just been talk. It had just been ideas and thoughts and dreams and philosophies and words. But now in an instant on a phone call, it moves from theory to action. And that's what we get when we come to Nehemiah chapter three. So let me, let me read the first five verses. Um, and I'm, I'm only gonna read the first five verses because it's actually a long chapter, but actually the first five verses give us a summary of what the whole passage is about. So let me read God's word for us. Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place building as far as the tower of the hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the tower of Hananel. Then the men of Jericho built the adjoining section, and Zucker, son of Imri, built the next to him. The fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassanah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Meremoth, son of Uriah, the son of Hakoz, repaired the next section, 
Next to him, Meshulam, son of Berechiah, the son of Meshabel, made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, the son of Banna, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. And we thank God for his word. Now, you can probably tell right away that this is not the sort of Bible passage that's gonna make your heart sore, okay? We're not reading this passage like we're reading the Psalms. This is not emotive in any way. This is just very informational, transactional piece of the Bible. There are 41 sections on the wall of Jerusalem and we're given the details of the 40 groups of people who are actually building and contributing to the work. So as you can imagine already, this is not thrilling stuff, but this is an important reminder for us as Bible readers and as a Bible-centered church that while the Bible was written for us, it wasn't written to us. And so it's at moments like this where we need to do some work of trying to understand, well, what relevance does this have for our lives? My family is a bilingual family. I know some of yours are as well. Our bilinguality, I think that's the word, is Northern Irish English and Canadian English. So my wife and I speak Northern Irish English and my children speak Canadian English. Now the great thing about the Irish accent is that we've discovered if you just speak fast enough, it kind of descends into like, an unintelligible sound. And so as Rebecca and I have been raising our children, one of the things that we've discovered is that when we're in the car, say, and we're on a road trip, and we need to have a parent, like an adult-only conversation, we just talk faster, and our kids can't understand what we're saying. <laughs> it's amazing. Now, until we then need to communicate something to our children, in which they will often respond by quoting from Rush Hour, we cannot understand the words that are coming out of your mouth. And they'll say that often to Rebecca and I. We're actually, hopefully one day, gonna be a multilingual family, working super hard on our Australian English right now. Yeah, 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 no. Is that, is that, is that, is that how it goes? Nehemiah 3 is, it's a bit of an awkward chapter. And actually, it probably wasn't in the original memoir, but was added after the fact. It's written in the same language, but it sounds really different. And if you've read, if you've taken time to read through Nehemiah, you'll have felt that change. And the reason it feels a little different is because it is a little different. And see, the rest of the book is a story. It's a, it's a memoir, it's, it's someone's personal history. Here you have in this chapter what is actually an official building report. This was a government document. Scholars think that what likely happened was that this document was filed and then a copy was kept at the temple. And then another copy was sent back to Nehemiah's hometown, back to Susa, back to the king as a report. And then at some point along the way, when Nehemiah was compiling his memoir, he took a copy of that official document and put it right there into the middle of his book, a little bit like you and I for filling out a job application or a visa application and they ask for more evidence. We might look through our, all our old files to find a bank statement or to find a birth certificate. And so we know like, it's kind of like adding strength to the work, and that's what's going on here in Nehemiah chapter three. But that presents problems for us who read it, who are reading the Bible, because it's hard to read. How do you read an official government report? Well, normally with your eyes closed and sleeping, right? That's what happens. But it's hard to read, it's hard to preach, it's hard to pay attention to God's voice in the midst of it, and so that's why we slow down. That's why we need to slow down at moments like this, to pay attention to the Holy Spirit what he might want to say to us. And there's some really, when we do that with Nehemiah 3, there's some really helpful devotional kind of thoughts that can really stir our hearts, believe it or not. Uh, here's a couple I want to share with you this morning. The first one's this. Our faith must be modeled for others to see. People don't see what we believe. They see how we believe. They don't see our faith. They see the actions of our faith. And there's this really interesting moment right at the start of Nehemiah 3 when the, wall, or when the work commences on the wall that the first people to step into action are the priests. I think that's an incredibly important insight for us to see. 
See, our faith doesn't demand action. It's actually demonstrated by action. And here we have a bunch of holy men whose job it was to lead people in the life of worship, and yet we find them with their work gloves and their tool belts, and they're on the wall getting mucked in. The priests are modeling faith. They don't just talk about faith, they actually live it out. So here in Nehemiah 3 is actually right at the start is a beautiful illustration of what I think real spiritual leadership looks like. It looks like imitative faith. It looks like professional people and non-professional people coming together to learn from one another how to follow and live for God. It's about proximity and about posture. People are side by side with the priests. I think it's really super interesting to me that in the modern iteration of the church, this is just a little aside, but the church's addiction to professional communicators and content creators. Do you know the difference between a pastor and a professional communicator? It's proximity to people. And that's so different. And I, for me, I just don't understand because I'm not wired that way. Why I would want someone who doesn't know me and have a relationship with me to come and speak into my life. And yet we seem, as, a, as churches in general, that we love that. Instead of the proximity and posture of life side by side. Whenever I was in college, my granda, okay, who, whose name is Big Tommy, okay, because Big Tommy was Big Tommy. And in Ireland, everyone's name is prefixed with a size. Okay, so he was Big Tommy. And Big Tommy was a general manager of a timber yard or carpentry works. And so he got me a job working there and I worked as a laborer, you know, which involved going to the shop to pick up lunches for the actual workers who knew what they were doing, things like that. Whenever I was working there, my younger brother, Glenn, now Glenn's not like the rest of my family. My family is we John and we Sandra and I'm we Steve. And then my sister's even smaller than me. But then my brother, my younger brother's like six foot two, he's big Glenn. So Big Glenn was working alongside Big Tommy in the timber yard, and he was serving his time as an apprentice carpenter. Now, I, I wrote down the translation here for those of you who don't know what that, that's a chippy, all right? Now, I, I, someone's gonna have to explain to me how you get chippy from working with, as a carpenter, but you can do that later on. But during my lunch breaks, I would go in to visit my brother while he was in the carpenter's workshop. And in the carpenter's workshop in this particular timber yard, there were eight tables, four for the carpenters and four for their apprentices. And what always struck me was how close those tables were to each other. They were in groups of two, where there would be a carpenter, a fully experienced carpenter, and then an apprentice. And the apprentice worked so closely with the carpenter so that he was learning from the carpenter his skill and his trade and his craft. It was about proximity, but it was also about posture. It was about the expert being willing to be close enough so that he could learn alongside and contribute to that person's life. That's just a little simple idea, but it's right there in the story of Nehemiah 3, of priests leaving the altar to actually work alongside people on the wall. I think another interesting devotional idea that comes out of Nehemiah 3 is the fact that this building project is bringing together all sorts of different people people from all sorts of different life stories and experiences and backgrounds and professions and socioeconomic status and even theology. There are people in the mix here that believe different things about Yahweh and who he is and how he works in the world. But when they come together, something special happens and everyone pitches in and contributes. And the result is you have people working alongside others who they would never have worked alongside. You have priests working alongside perfume makers and artisans working alongside musicians and alongside Levites, alongside beauticians and goldsmiths. You have people bringing skills and talents to the story whose lives would not have crossed paths otherwise. There's something so beautiful about that image that flows out of Nehemiah 3. Now, we're just given a list of names, but as we slow down and read those names, we can actually see who they are, what their stories were, what their jobs were, what their skills were. And you see that God is doing something special in how he builds community and calls people together from different stories around a central idea. Now, you and I know that to be Jesus and how he calls us together around him 
and around his work in our lives, but he's bringing together in this place in, in Riverview people who are scholars and people who are chippies. Chippies can be scholars too, right? And chippies are where you get your fish and chips if you go to Ireland. That's just a little aside. <laughs> Another little noticeable devotional thought from Nehemiah 3 is found in Nehemiah 3, 5, where we're told that the nobles of Tekoa were not willing to help. So you'll notice that there were 41 sections to the wall and only 40 groups of people who were willing to work, which meant somebody had to do a double shift. And the people who did the double shift were the ordinary working class people of Tekoa because the rich, the affluent, the aristocratic, the celebrity families of their day from Tekoa were not willing, the scripture says, to put their shoulder to the work. And that's just a simple idea, but it's a reminder that status and position is no measure of character or authenticity or integrity. In fact, this group of super rich, super wealthy, super, influ super influential people who didn't want to get involved, didn't want to be a part of the work, they're actually kind of documented here as the Bible's first backsliders. Now, I should have checked first, but does the word backslider translate into Australian? Okay, so that's a word that you would know. Well, this is actually where the word backslider comes from. We're told that the nobles of Tekoa would not put their shoulder to the work. And actually in Hebrew, it's the word neck, not shoulder, but neck. Would not put their neck to the, to the work. And what that meant was that was actually drawn from imagery from farming. It was like an oxen who wouldn't take the yoke. And so when the oxen wouldn't take the yoke, it would slide back from the yoke. And so it wouldn't take the neck wouldn't put its neck to the work. And so you have this group of people who wouldn't put their neck to the work. And so the Bible calls them backsliders. And it's interesting that the first backsliders in the Bible, the reason they were backsliders is because they just thought they were better than everyone else. That's maybe what a backslider is. And if that's what a backslider is, we probably all know a whole bunch of backsliders. <laughs> people who think they're better than others are too good to do the work. And it's just some simple ideas. But amazing what happens when you slow down with the text alongside the Holy Spirit and you say, Lord, what do you wanna say? How do you wanna speak to the church? Now, with that being said, there's a few things I'd actually like to say this morning. Is that okay? Can you hang with me just for a little bit longer? Because in this somewhat emotionless passage of the Bible, that's really about construction in a war-torn city, something that we're gonna continue to see over the coming months, I imagine, as images and stories flow back from Ukraine and other parts of the world that are in conflict. You have gotta rebuild, you gotta put things back together again after they've been broken down. And there's tons of lessons in this passage, but I just wanted to document a few of them with you this morning that aren't devotional, I think they're actually biblical. The kind of meat of the passage. Here's the first one. If you're a note taker, again, this is your time to shine. In God's great rebuilding work, everyone is invited to participate. In God's great rebuilding work, everyone is invited to participate. Part of being a pastor that's different than being a professional communi communicator or just a content creator, right? Part of being a pastor, what's different about that is proximity to people. You have to be close to people. Now, that comes with a massive risk, okay? And part of how that risk has flushed its way out in my life as a pastor is that I am constantly asked really random questions by people. I mean, super random questions. Because once that proximity is put in place, people feel that they can come and just ask questions or say whatever they want. And so, you know, I've had people come up to me, now not in Australia. You guys are not geographically challenged like some parts of the world. But I've had people ask me while I was living in North America if I knew that Ireland was an island. <laughs> hey, Steve, do you know Ireland's an island? Yes, I do. <laughs> I'm from that island. On that same day, I kid you not, someone asked my wife, uh, excuse me, Rebecca, um, in Ireland, is there electricity? <laughs> yes. I feel like the last movie they watched was maybe The Quiet Man from John Wayne or something. I don't know. Anyway. This proximity, it creates risk, okay? Because relationships are like that. And one of the other spaces I find this fleshes way out in my life is on my social media. 
Okay, so people will just comment on stuff all the time, and I'm mostly positive, occasionally random, and occasionally you have to hit the delete button, and very occasionally the unfollow button, okay? I know you've all done that as well. Now, here's the thing. My wife and I actually keep a little collection of screenshots from the times that people have written random things on our social media, and things that they maybe didn't know what they meant, they said something out of context, or autocorrect, right? So there was a picture of my family and I put onto my Facebook and we were in the front uh, row of our church when we were living in Calgary. And it was one of those beautiful moments that someone caught on a camera where we're worshiping Jesus together as a family. And I had my hands up worshiping Jesus and my wife didn't. And Isabella had her eyes closed and it was super cute. And I can't even remember where she was, probably climbing on something. But someone caught this picture and put it, and it was on Facebook, and people were liking it. You know, that's, that's so good. And then there was this beautiful, godly, and I want to say older lady, okay, just to try to be PC with my language, older lady who also wrote a comment. But bless her, she didn't check the autocorrect. So her statement was, oh, how much I would love to be sitting in your pew. Now, the word pew was autocorrected. Now you're gonna to have to do the wordle on that. It could be two words, and I'll let you guess what it is. And if you remember at the end, you can come and ask me, but I have a documented evidence of someone saying, I would like to sit in your something else in, in church. Now, that's, it's so random. Why are you even telling us this story, Steve? I'm not even sure, because I'm completely lost in my notes. Here's the, here's, here's the thing. Probably the question that I get asked the most. Every time I meet someone for a coffee, someone, and I don't drink coffee, someone for a walk, someone to connect with, will almost always ask. I think they're interested or else someone somewhere made up, this is what you, how you speak to a minister, but they'll almost always ask, why are you a pastor? Why, 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 why did you wanna be a pastor? Why do you wanna be a minister? Well, can I just tell you, it's because of moments like this in Nehemiah 3, or the formation of the early church movement, or the great movements of God throughout all of history, and it's this, because I really believe, like actually with every fiber of my being, that God delights in using ordinary people to do extraordinary things for his glory. That's why. That's why I'm a pastor. That's why I'm a pastor who wants to be in proximity with people because I believe with all my heart that that's who God is, a God who desires and delights in using ordinary people for his glory. So if you're here this morning and you would consider yourself to be normal, ordinary, or maybe even not that great, maybe not that talented, then can I just tell you, you are the perfect raw material for God to use for his glory and his story. I know part of the vision that God's stirring in our hearts as a church right now is that we would be a community of participation, not just a church that people go to, because we don't go to church, we are the church. We don't wanna be a church that people just go to or where they just attend, but rather one where they are known, where their gifts and talents are known, like their identity is known, and where we all work together in the work of the Great Commission. That, that's our vision. It's a little bit like the, that of Nehemiah. Everyone taking their place on the wall. Everyone using their gifts and talents and passions, their creativity, their experience, and their heart, and all of us building together. In God's great rebuilding work, everyone is invited to participate, okay? Here's the next thing. For the Christian, all work is holy. Did you know that? For the Christian, all work is holy. The beauty of the story in Nehemiah 3 is this group of people coming together to do this great work. But you'll not, like, you'll not be mistaken in thinking it's not that spiritual a work. They're actually ordained by God. But other than that, there's no holy language. It's not hyper-spiritualized. It's not dressed up with prophetic imagery or anything like that. It's just gritty and sweaty and dirty and filthy and it's the Middle East and it's dusty and they don't have all the tools that they need and there's no hot dogs, right? It's not like you can go to Bunnings and get a hot dog. This is hard, sweaty work and yet at the same time, it's absolutely holy. See, the work on the walls for the priests 
was as holy as their work at the altar. This project happens right at the intersection of the sacred and the secular. And the lines are blurred, and I love that. I love that because I think probably most of us have grown up and been shaped in a faith that taught us to compartmentalize our approach to faith in God. This is holy, this is not holy. This is part of my Christian life, this is not part of my Christian life. This is my other life. This story encourage us, encourages us that God does not think about our lives in this way with these defining lines. You see, the walls that needed to be rebuilt and restored truly did need to be rebuilt and restored for spiritual reasons because God's name and fame and honor was attached to Jerusalem. But at the same time, at the very same time, the walls needed to be rebuilt to provide safety and stability for the inhabitants of the city. The sacred and the secular were just the same thing. They were just all meshed up together. It was ordinary people doing ordinary work, but at the same time, extraordinary faith-filled people serving an extraordinary God. You know, for people like me, okay, so I'm, I'm this professional Christian leader, passages like this are a lesson and a reminder in not over-spiritualizing my work. But for everyone else who has careers and jobs in the real world, it's also a great reminder to not under-spiritualize your work. What makes our work holy is the presence of the Holy One within us. The Holy Spirit work within us, working out His purposes in our everyday lives. So for the Christian, everything that we are and do, including our work, is holy. All right? Okay. Last thing I wanna say. Number three. Sometimes God asks us to do hard things. Come on, Steve. We were with you, but not anymore. <laughs> Listen, I get it, all right? I'm at the age now where I've lived long enough to have seen change. Our professional lives are changing. The world is changing with automation, technology, even good research into health and mental health and even effectiveness. Our work lives are looking different, more different than they ever have. More people are working from home. Some countries have already changed a, a four-day working week. Like people are trying to pay attention to how do you work and maintain health and all that stuff. And that's so awesome. But part of the risk of a cultural narrative that says work less actually is shaping our understanding that following God should maybe be less invasive, less demanding, less sacrificial. And truthfully, okay, this is kind of a pastoral honesty moment. There's probably some good in that, okay? Because God is not a hardcore taskmaster, slave driver God. In fact, the entire story of the Bible is set up to teach us that that's not who God is at all. Yahweh, the God of Israel, is the God who breaks the yoke of slavery, who invites his people into a place of rest, who gives the gift of Sabbath. But with all that said, he is still the God who often asks his people to do hard things. He asks us to step into and do hard things, things that challenge us, things that cost us, maybe even things that scare us. See, the way of the Christian faith is the way of the cross. We are called to live cross-shaped lives, dying to ourselves and living for Jesus, who died and now lives in us. Now here's the beauty of this transaction, guys. We are not asked to pick up his cross. And I'm so thankful for that because I cannot imagine the burden of that cross, the weight of the sin of the whole world upon it. But we are asked to take up our cross and what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us individually? But what does that mean for us as a church? What does it mean to lay down parts of us, parts of our lives? What does it mean to live sacrificially? What does it mean to do hard things? What does it mean to do things that cost? You know, one of the hardest things I believe that we're being asked to do at Riverview at the minute is to actually join God in the rebuilding of his church here. Now, you're like, why is that hard, Steve? That's like super exciting. And on the surface, it might seem exciting, but under the surface, it's really hard work because building is hard work and building and rebuilding walls is hard work. 
Now, this is, this is just back to the passage, so you know I'm not kind of making this stuff up. But the finer details about Nehemiah 3, while it gives us lots of names and lots of skills and talents and all that stuff, because it's an official government document, it's actually really all about measurements. It's telling us about the actual dimensions of the wall of Jerusalem. That's why we're told what gates are in play, what sections in play. Actually, being, we're being given a geographic picture, a really important geographic picture. We're given all these measurements. And one of the things we discover is that Nehemiah was actually building on top of old walls. It was the walls that Hezekiah had put up, King Hezekiah, who was one of the good ones. King Hezekiah built this incredible wall, strengthened the wall around the city, then the wall is obviously taken down by the Babylonians and now Nehemiah is back and he's rebuilding the wall. And we're, as we follow the content of Nehemiah 3, I know it's super boring, but as we follow the content of the actual bricks and mortar and, and timber, we see that Nehemiah is building on, on the rubble of these old walls. But one of the things we also discover as we do that and then as we dig into some history and as we lean into some recent archaeology, one of the things we discover is that Nehemiah's walls were nowhere near as big and exciting and powerful as Hezekiah's walls were before him. In fact, they were about half the size, half the height, half the width. I mean, they still got the job done, but it was a different day. And I think one of the hard things that we're discovering as God's people right now, because I mean, Ryan mentioned this last week when he was teaching us about Ezra and Nehemiah and how they're the same book. But basically the pattern is this, the people return to God and they rebuild. They return and they rebuild. There's this pattern that flows through Ezra and Nehemiah. But on both occasions, what God has instructed in the rebuilding is nowhere near as big and shiny, as exciting as what it used to be. You have a temple that's nowhere near as glorious as it used to be. And yet it was the temple that God himself instructed to be built and that Jesus would come and, and set food in. You've got this, uh, these walls that were being called to build, but they're maybe not the walls like they used to be. And I think the thing I've been wrestling with all week, like what is the hard thing that we're being called to at Riverview Church? I think it's the, it's the learning this, that revival and renewal and rebuilding does not mean repeating. And I just wanna say that again, that revival and renewal and rebuilding does not mean repeating. Now, why is that hard? Because we are hardwired for nostalgia. We love it. Who wasn't super excited to sing My Jesus, My Savior this morning? And I would love to know where you were translated to because it wasn't Riverview on a Sunday morning. I was walking down the aisle with my wife because we were singing My Jesus, My Savior as we left the church in July 2004, right? We are hardwired for nostalgia. It's why we love TV shows like Stranger Things and Cobra Kai. It's why all the Star Wars fans are super excited this week that Obi-Wan Kenobi's TV show's coming out because we're so hardwired for nostalgia. Now, I wanna, I, I wanna celebrate that. One of the great gifts that God gives his creation is memory. And anyone, who, anyone who's got family battling with dementia or Alzheimer's will know, you will know what a gift memory is. Memory is an incredible gift. And so it's good to look back. But the reason we look back is so that we remember that God is faithful. Now we can move forward full of faith. Okay, we don't look back to go live there. We look back to learn the lessons of there so that we can build on that and learn from that and move forward. And that's an important lesson that we learn out of Nehemiah is that we might be addicted to the past, but God isn't. We might be addicted to what God's done before, but God isn't. God is always doing something new and then calling us to it, calling us to it. Now, let me just clarify, just in case you think that I'm a, I'm a history basher or a Riverview Church of the Past basher. Absolutely not, because here's one really important little textual idea. The building report on the walls doesn't actually say that the walls were rebuilt. The gates were rebuilt, but the walls weren't. The walls were actually, the Hebrew word is strengthened. The walls were strengthened. In other, in other words, they took what was already there and what was good, they put it back up again and they built on top of. And that is a biblical idea 
of building on the next generation, taking what's good and what's true and building on that from generation to generation. Each generation builds on the work of another. And may we be a church that celebrates the past, finds the good in it, but then finds the God in the here and now and partners with him in what he wants to do in the future. Amen? Amen. Now, as Ryan comes up, Ryan, would you come up? Let me, let me just say one little thing before I hand over to Ryan, who's gonna take us home today. But you'll notice that the story of Nehemiah chapter three is not dissimilar from the story of the Christian gospel. Christian gospel is a message of a God who invites very ordinary, disqualified people who just aren't good enough, that's us, to come into his story through his son, Jesus. And we're made holy, not because of who we are, our gifts or talents or efforts or anything, but because of who Jesus is. We're invited into this story. And I just wanted to remind you that we're, we're not just a Bible community, we're a Jesus community. And if there's anyone here today who would love to know more about Jesus, to find out and discover who Jesus is, we would love to talk to you. We would hate you to leave here today and know loads about Nehemiah, but don't, not know anything about Jesus. Okay, so we would love to invite you to come and chat to pastors or actually just the people around you. They're just as holy as we are, believe it or not. Or you can go talk to the people out in the foyer. But if you would like to know more about Jesus, we would love to tell you about him.